we are going to have another interesting uh, presentation by Mr. Eric Conquest, who is the director of East Asia Center at the Central Connecticut University. Before I uh, invite Eric to the podium, I would like to uh, briefly introduce him. Eric Kronqvist was born in Sweden, and he developed interest in China in, at a very early age. He has been involved with China since 1996. He contributed to one of the first online newsletters and blogs <coughs> on China back in 1997, and worked with film, film production and online media in Beijing before moving to the USA three years ago. Since uh, moving to the USA, he has been working to promote US-China relationship. He traveled with Governor Dan Malloy's delegation to China in September 2012, and he's currently involved uh, in the establishment of Connecticut's first Confucius Institute. This afternoon, Eric is going to share with us his uh, th thoughts about how China is uh, exerting its influence with soft power, its persuasion, and uh, he he's going to share his insights from his own experience. So let me introduce, uh, le let me welcome uh, Eric Kronquist. Please join me in. in Thank you, and, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so my name is Eric Kronqvist, and uh, as you just heard, I'm originally from Sweden. Uh, I've been here in this country for three years, and I'm currently working in something called the US-China Center at Central Connecticut State University. And, and we do a lot of the uh, uh, outreach that Connecticut State is involved uh, with, and specifically with the sister state relationship that Connecticut has with Shandong province. Uh, and uh, it was in this capacity that I traveled with, with uh, Governor Malloy uh, to China last year. Just on, on a side note on that, um, uh, it's, we've, uh, Connecticut actually has a very long history with the sister state relationship with Shandong. It was established already in 1986, which from what I understand for, for this country was a, a, a fairly, it's rather early uh, establishment of such a relationship. Um, but since then, not a single governor had taken the time to actually travel uh, to China. And uh, we might see this, the, the, the fact that uh, Governor Malloy last year decided to travel, that uh, the attention to China and, and the relationship on, on, on the state level um, has, has, been, has been improved. And uh, another thing also which uh, connects to that is um, that the Chinese government seems very interested at this point to establish the, these types of relationship on the state level, um, where you can do a kind of a matchmaking to see different regions and, and their different needs and then match them up with different regions with similar interests and similar uh, goals and so on in, in the US. So that's, that's a little bit of my background. We are also currently establishing Connecticut's first Confucius Institute. And I'm not sure if all of you are aware of, of, of the Confucius Institute program. Um, it's definitely part of what I'm going to talk about since it's, it's sort of one of the centerpieces of um, what we might want to call the Chinese uh, soft power endeavor. Um, and that's a little bit of what I'm going to talk about. Um, I'm going to talk, I'm, I'm not actually employed by the Confucius Institute, but I, I think it might be appropriate to do a full disclosure and say that I do work with, with the Confucius Institute. Um, uh, but um, I will mention it and we will talk about it and uh, feel free to ask any questions about it. Um, uh, so, and before I begin my presentation here, I'd also like to thank, of course, Professor Ilahi and the Department of International Business here at CUNYPAC for inviting me. Um, and as I just said, I've been invited to talk about soft power uh, and China. Uh, I've chosen to call this presentation China in the Age of Persuasion. And uh, I chose this word persuasion because I think there is something to this word um, that says something about what soft power or sort of a, a, a good working soft power uh, project needs. It needs someone who is persuading, 
but that's not enough. It also requires someone who is willing to be persuaded. And, and it's in this dynamic um, that you can have an effective um, soft power. Uh, let's, let's use, we can, we can choose other words. I mean, we can talk about cultural influence or cultural capital and so on. They're all part of, part of the same, same, um, same goals and so on. Um, and of course, one can engage in soft power in different ways, many ways. Um, we can talk about sort of more or less direct economic incentives, financial aid and so on, and, uh, and China is of course involved in all that. Uh, we can also look at it um, as sort of some kind of political incentives and how you cooperate through international organizations and so on. Um, but today I'm going to focus on the cultural aspects, which I think, I believe actually was sort of when the, 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 the concept of soft power was first uh, established, this was more or less what we were talking about, sort of kind of ex extend your cultural influence for the benefit of, of all the other things, such as trade and, and political influence and so on. Um, and I'd, I'd like to argue that Chinese soft power has two distinctive goals. Um, one is, of course, to promote a, 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 a positive image of a peaceful and, and modern China. Uh, and specifically, it's, it's non-interventionist foreign policy. That's sort of one of the corner pieces of their, their foreign policy. And it's, you can see through their, um, how they project through their, their soft power missions and so on. And the second point would be to promote a historic narrative that will allow China to reestablish itself um, in a position where it, 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 it believes itself to belong. And this goes back to sort of a, 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 a long history um, uh, where there is this, a, a sense that China has been wronged throughout history. Um, uh, and, and there is also the sensation that, or the sense that they want now to, it's, it's, it's just a matter of time before China gets the chance to reestablish itself in the position that it was always supposed to have. And, and this is also something that you can see through through the, the, the images and messages that, that China is projecting through their soft power projects. Um, and both of these goals are laid out on top of a, what could be seen as a nationalist agenda. Um, and as such, it also sometimes becomes hard to distinguish where the line goes between hard and soft power. And I think we have saw um, an example of that last year when um, uh, we had the, the dispute of uh, the Diaoyin and Senkaku Island uh, where um, you had from, uh, actually from, from a, if you compare it to what happened in 1999, if you remember when, when NATO uh, uh, bombed the, the Chinese embassy in Belgrade and the demonstration followed upon that were very aggressive. And, and they actually sort of made, made an attempt to attack the American embassy in Beijing and so on. Um, the demonstrations last year were, were a much more peaceful and almost sort of a celebratory uh, style. And I happened to be in, in Guangzhou uh, at the time and, and um, for some reason I was in the hotel where the Japanese consulate also had their offices. So um, it was it was this moment where it was actually impossible to leave, um, leave the hotel because we were completely surrounded by a large number. I mean, I think the numbers that came out was something between 80 and 100,000 people came, came out on the streets that day. Uh, but walking out, leaving there, was, it, was, um, it was a very different atmosphere. and, and uh, than, than, than previous demonstrations that I've, I've witnessed um, where, where sort of the, the, um, sort of the nationalistic sentiments have been displayed in a much more sort of aggressive, aggressive manner. Uh, but, but again, the lines between those demonstrations uh, and that display, that urge to sort of commute, communicate to the world uh, the, the true sentiment of, of, of the Chinese people um, in, through these demonstrations, and then sort of the the preparations to or the threats to actually uh, engage in some kind of, of military conflict, 
it may be not so easy to always follow where that line goes exactly. So, again, this goes back to this history of, of, of um, perceived humiliations by specifically the Western powers in Japan. Um, and I'm mentioning this here in, in talking about Chinese soft power because it's, it's, it's a widespread um, a viewpoint among what I would call common people in China. Um, and it's, it's part of what you could call an emotional core of many of the issues that we can use to describe where China sees itself today and, and the, push, the position it wishes to take in the world. And this sense of mistreatment is also part of the cultural reference, references that bring together on the one hand the official nationalist agenda and the soft power projects of the Chinese government with on the other the ideas expressed by people and organizations not directly connected to the government. And, and in, this, uh, in this it creates kind of an, an, a, a zone, uh, a space of a common purpose where um, uh, sort of the, the, the general sentiment of the people and, and the, the activities of the government actually coincide. They do not always do that, of course. Um, and it also gives the soft power project as it's seen and as it's, as it's used with some kind of, with purpose and meaning. And um, here we can look at, of course, of uh, sort of the official projects. I would like to say that a lot of, a lot of soft power is not done through official channels always. It can be done by private interests. And this is something that I see quite a, quite a lot in China, that uh, something that we might see a corporation doing philanthropic work to increase their some kind of, of goodwill uh, work. In China, that is quite often connected to some kind of the same nationalist agenda. So let's say that you have a, a company and you want to establish some kind of relationship with your local government. You might want to invest in something that will promote China's image abroad because it seems like it's, it's seen and it's, it's looked upon as, as a, a vital project of re-establishing China as, as the great power that it's always been um, and, and, and give it back the place where it should be. Um, so, and, and for these people involved in these projects, um, when I talk to them and, and so on, they, it seems like being part of this, being part of, 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 of helping with this project of, of promoting Chinese culture and so on, abroad specifically, and specifically in the US, it, it gives them a sense of purpose. It, 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 it's something that they are very excited about uh, and one might think that it might fill a void of sort of an ideological void that you infuse um, your sometimes sort of maybe reluctant connections to or sort of by necessity only connections with the party system and so on with some kind of purpose, with a meaning. And, and, and that's, that I think that's, that's a true sort of sentiment that a lot of people have. Um, also, I mean, I, I trying to figure out how uh, how soft power works. I, I was thinking about how, how did how did the U.S. go about doing this in the, especially after the Second World War. Um, there was this point, right, when a large part of the world suddenly started resonating with the American dream, and, and sort of the America became the the uh, um, the ideal for for a lot of people. Um, I'd like to think that what's happening there is that one, you have sort of a systematic push for to promote your national culture or your uh, your cultural influence around the world, but it also requires, or at least in the the, the way that I see it that made the American soft power project so successful in the 50s was that there was also some kind of counterculture that was going on um, that. Uh, seemed to be coming from somewhere else with a certain distance from the sort of the, the government. And, and as, as it was perceived, you know, we talk about rock and roll, we talk about jazz, we talk about 
film and literature and so on, beat, beat literature at the time. All these things um, gave a sense that there was sort of an, an organic, genuine culture going on. At the same time, although it might have been perceived as a counterculture, uh, if you look at it with, with some distance, maybe you see that they were actually promoting the same kind of values as the sort of the American official soft power project. And I think when these two elements are combined, sort of an, a sense of an organic, natural, uh, genuine expression of, of culture, when that coincides with the sort of the more official soft power projects, then you get sort of something very potent and it becomes persuasive. Uh, and, and it's easier to sort of, and, and you can start and then suddenly this, the project of soft power starts to work on, on the audience. So it, it seems that a nation must be able to harbor expressions that seemingly go against the mainstream or the official state rhetoric, um, but at the core resonate with the basic values of the predominant culture of the nation and the culture that, that the soft power projects are to promote. And if we go back to the Chinese project, um, a lot of a lot of skepticism can be can be found about the Chinese soft power project. And I think it it, it connects to this in some sense. Um, because the cultural expression needs something to cling on to on the receiving end. Uh, a persuasive lure that propaganda alone cannot instill in its audience. And so the, a very common critique of the Chinese soft power endeavor is, is this, the lack of a persuasive power beyond the sheer weight of the transformation the country uh, that we have seen from China as, uh, as it's gone through in the last three decades. And within this critique lies a tricky dilemma for China, as, as, because as soon as it presents itself in a modern fashion, be it through architecture or, or, or literature or art or, or music or anything else, voices um, outside China are immediately raised to claim that what, what is there that can be claimed to be modern is in fact just an attempt to mimic something essentially Western. And, and um, in this way, the attempt to emulate fails to provide China with a unique and, and in that sense, persuasive identity. And, and so China kind of gets stuck in this vicious circle where it's pushed back into its own traditional dress and it's once again sort of battling with, with this image of and, and the shadows of its own historical weak position um, and, and, and that sort of takes out some of the power of, of, of this, this, the, the attempt to sort of create or expand the, the Chinese uh, cultural influence. And, and so we can see that, of course, that, again, this is sort of something that goes back and forth. We need to have someone who's ready to receive the message. And through this ideologically orchestrated dance routine between mostly the West and China, I would say, Chinese culture ends up being described as traditional, conservative, and you have, and it's sort of, it's pushed to constantly evoke its long history and rich traditions rather than present itself as a modern, sort of modern nation. Um, And this, I think, it's also connected to that the general understanding of Chinese history and culture in the West is, to be quite honest, it's, it's, it's quite limited. Uh, and so these expressions, in order to make sense for the, on the receiving end, they have, by necessity, they have to be fairly superficial. So we get sort of a, a regurgitating, regurgitating, a sort of a, a we always tend to see the same images played over and over again, the dragon dances and, and, and the calligraphy, but only at a superficial level. We're never invited really through these projects to get a deeper understanding of what's actually going on in the history and, and the complexity of history and so on. Um, and so if we look at how Chinese soft power is, is discussed in Western media, uh, I just took a quick look the other day and Googled a few articles, and the last three articles that I could find was one in The Diplomat back in January saying, and the, the, the headline was, Destined to Fail, Chinese Soft Power Push. Uh, the New York Times said in January last year, Why China is Weak on Soft Power, and this month The Atlantic has a, 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 a series of, of um, commentaries on this and, and with the question, Can China do soft power? 
And if you read it, the answer is no. <laughs> sort of that's, that's the conclusion that these articles make. Um, and it seems like the, the consensus of these articles is that it's not possible in China um, because they do not they do not handle very well these seemingly countercultures, the cultures that might seemingly go against the official voice of the of the government, but if you look at them closely, might actually be promoting the same ideals. Um, because of this, Chinese soft power, at least as we understand it or as we are ready to receive it and accept it, does not work. Um, and of course, I mean, at the same time, China's rise is coming at a different historical time than what after the, the, the Second World War and the Cold War era, um, and which, which makes it kind of difficult for, for China. I mean, if, if you look at it, it's almost impossible um, to, to persuade the West of, of, of a modern Chinese culture, and partly due to the West's fear of an over, overly powerful China. And it seems like the Chinese government can never win. First, the West embraces the loudest critics of that same government. That's, for example, Gao Xinjian, when he received the Nobel Prize for Literature uh, a little bit over 10 years ago. Um, and, you know, in a sense, the first Chinese to receive this prize, now Mo Yang got it last year, but, but Gao Xinjian was, of you know, he was a, an artist living in exile in France with a French passport. And another example, of course, is, is uh, the artist Ai Weiwei, who you might have heard of as well, who's sort of a very prolific uh, and very politically outspoken artist. Um, and of course, it's impossible for the Chinese government to embrace these. But when they finally embrace artists that might have, see, have, have been in similar positions before, like Zhang Yimou and, and, and Mo Yan, for, as another example, then immediately people say, well, how much were they paid? So, so there's, it's, it's almost impossible for the Chinese government to, to interact with these other types of, of cultural expressions that would, the way I see it, would make sort of the soft power endeavor become potent and become, become uh, persuasive. Um, I'd like to sort of finally bring up two examples. Of course, I'm, uh, the Confucius Institute is, is a good example of, of sort of the official structure, the infrastructure of, of the Chinese soft power project. And um, you feel free to ask me any questions about how, how it works and so on. Um, it's, it's a, it's the, it has a 10 year old uh, history now. It was started in 2004. Um, and by now there are around 400 of them around the world. Uh, 91 of them are here in the US, which kind of tells you the importance that China puts on, on, on US in terms of their sort of cultural diplomacy outreach. Uh, one, one, one in every four Confucius Institutes are here in this country. Um, from what I've seen, and um, what it was started the kind of programs that the Confucius Institute would promote would be specifically these words that would sort of uh, perpetuate this image of, of, of a superficial understanding of traditional Chinese culture. Uh, and now 10 years on, I think they're doing a better job. They've, they're much more flexible and seem to understand that for this to work, you have to speak to the local audience. You cannot just have one program for the whole world. You need to interact with what's going on locally and more or less see it as you're part of a, 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 a discussion, a, a dialogue, rather than just having it as sort of a, a, a megaphone for, for, um, for Chinese culture. And, and in that sense, I think, I think um, China's come a long way in, in sort of understanding how to, how, to, how to do this sort of practically. Uh, but in the end, it, it's, I do not believe that it's going to be successful until they actually allow these other, other sort of uh, cultural expressions in within the system. Uh, so I would like to present another way that Chinese soft power might actually be more successful. And, and um, last year, a, a Chinese real estate um, company called Wanda they're based up in, in, in uh, Liaoning province in Dalian. 
they purchased um, the AMC movie theaters here in, in the US. And this was a, a, this was a large purchase. Uh, and if you read a lot of the business reports at the time, they were talking about a real estate company moving in and, and, and it getting engaged in, in American real estate. But that's not really the whole truth because uh, at this point, they're already recruiting people in Los Angeles to do film production. So it was very, um, it's, it seems at, at least that is, it was a very deliberate move into uh, getting the hands on the tools to produce t for cultural production. Uh, which, is, which is really interesting because I think this is one of the first examples that I've seen where you suddenly have a Chinese company that's actually uh, directly in charge of setting the agenda for cultural production in another part of the world. And in interviews, what they're saying is that, well, our objective is, of course, to make money. And we are not going to be a mouthpiece for the Chinese government and promote only Chinese films. We are going to produce the films that will work on, on, with, with sort of a global audience. Uh, and that might be true. But uh, I'm quite sure that we're going to see an increase of, of Chinese actors, Chinese producers, Chinese scriptwriters uh, moving in towards an already existing system. And, and I, I think that this might actually be much more effective than sort of the kind of firm and clumsy structure of, of the Confucius Institute. So, so um, those are just two different different aspects of, of the same project. Um, I, uh, whenever I go back to China, I see a lot of things that I would say immediately, wow, this would, people would be very excited about this if it was brought here. Uh, Chinese graphic design, uh, very interesting. They're doing a lot of things. Chinese fashion, uh, a lot of Chinese literature is, is, uh, is getting to a point where it's, it's it, you know, I think their, their storytelling and, and the topics that they bring up would work very well if they were translated. But they're not at this point in time let into the official infrastructure of, of, of the soft power project, if you might want to call it, like, uh, call it that. So, so I'd like to just end on, on that note that I think that uh, the Chinese soft power project, as we've seen, it's, it's in, in, in the Western media, it's described as a failure or it's something that can never succeed. But we might be surprised that the, 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 the project itself might actually be successful, in a, but through a completely different means, a different infrastructure built on, on a, a, a private, uh, private basis rather than sort of an, an, uh, the, uh, the official uh, uh, governmental projects like the Confucius Institute. So I'd be happy to take some questions if you have any. Thank you very much. Can you say a little bit more about the Confucius Institute as it exists on your campus? What does it do? What's the mission? So uh, at the Confucius Institute, this is, uh, again, this is the first Confucius Institute in Connecticut. Um, and uh, our mission, uh, simply described, is to promote the teaching of Chinese language and culture. Uh, and the, the Confucius Institute is modeled on the, uh, the, the Goethe Institute of Germany and uh, Alliance Francaise in, in France and so on, uh, with the difference that they're actually trying to locate themselves on university campuses. I believe that the, both the Goethe Institutes and Alliance Francaise, they usually, they're located close to a university campus. but but they, they don't interact directly with, with, with the university. And the way it's set up is um, uh, the Confucius headquarters in, in Confucius Institute headquarters in Beijing is referred to as Hanban. Um, they ch select a, a university in, in China that will then find a partner in a hosting university. And in our case, uh, this has been done through our sister state relationship. So we are partnering with Shandong Normal University in Jinan, um, which makes sense because Central Connecticut Uni uh, State University used to be called a normal normal school as well. So we have that same kind of tradition. Uh, so that's that's the basic setup. Um, uh, the structure of it is you have um, a local director, uh, and then you have a Chinese director, and 
I think this is a pragmatic setup just to overcome some of the issues of just having two different systems to deal with, because this is basically what you have to do. You uh, and and I, I I can't say that it's easy to to work on these types of Chinese projects because they're. Uh, even if a lot of people that we work with understand what we're trying to do, that it's, it's mostly to promote uh, Chinese language classes uh, in the school districts that don't actually have access to it at this point. Um, there is uh, some suspicion about the purpose of this, and Chinese soft power in itself becomes sort of a, a very uh, a problematic term in itself. Uh, and I think it's not always politically viable to talk about it and support it op openly. And so uh, you kind of have to work through, sort of uh, zigzag your way through the system um, to, 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 to get it done. Mm -hmm. um, as you were talking, I was thinking if the soft power goals um, couldn't be channeled through the different Chinese communities around the world, can they be helpful to, you, to this program? I, I, think, I think that's absolutely true. I think, um, as I mentioned, uh, you see a lot of, of um, private entrepreneurs in China uh, that, as I see it, uh, uh, at, at least for some other people that I've been talking to, it seems to be filling, it seems to give um, their philanthropic uh, outreach some kind of purpose to be part of promoting Chinese culture. And definitely uh, a lot of this is also, it's designed to speak to a larger sense of, of you know, a, a Chinese, uh, uh, Chinese people in general around the world. And, and actually, one of, one of the interesting things with this is that I think finally the Chinese government has figured out a good way to deal with Taiwan, the Taiwan issue. And that is much more to make it much more inclusive in the general idea of a Chinese culture. Um, and and um, I, which I think is, 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 is brilliant. It's, 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 it's a good way to do it. So um, you have, and again, this is, this is a, a project, the Confucius Institute pro program is uh, coming from the central government in China, but you already have quite a few Taiwanese people running these institutes around the world. So, so in a sense, this soft power project, uh, at least the last few years, it seems, and, and also uh, depending on, on the political situation in Taiwan, maybe also more feasible to do so. But it, it, it has brought the idea of, of a larger community together. And I think that's, that's becoming a strategy of, of the, the Chinese government now. They see that, okay, this is actually working. This is, this is to our benefit. Mm. Uh, I have a question. Last year when I was visiting China, there was a big news published in many Chinese newspapers about the U.S. State Department revoking the visa of many visiting Chinese scholars who were teaching in different uh, Confucian centers. Mm -hmm. And at that time, it was seen as a big setback for the Confucian, Confucius Institute. Mm -hmm. uh, I wonder if there has been any improvement or if the U.S. government has eased the visa restrictions. Um, yes. That, uh it hasn't entirely been solved, or rather, I think the State Department considers it, it solved in the sense that they've now laid out the rules as, as they, they always were. They were just not followed before. Um, it was interpreted by Hanban, again, the, the Confucius Institute headquarters, as sort of a slap in the face and just saying, don't, don't, don't take this project too far. Know your place. Um, and but I think that might have been an overestimating uh, the, the, the actual sort of what, what the State Department was trying to communicate. But definitely there was something in that message that, that was um, saying that uh, um, be a little bit more careful when you develop these programs in the US. I think the, 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 the main problem was that you had um, a lot of the universities in China, they were sending not teachers over here to teach, but they were sending their own students um, and grad students, but also undergrad students who came here and they were teaching in public schools around the country. And I think one of the problems was that just the quality of, of the teaching was not at a level that was acceptable. And that's why they said, well, you, 
you need to find, uh, you can no longer, um, uh, the institutes themselves can no longer uh, sponsor these teachers. They have to be sponsored either through um, the, the Board of Education in the state or the different school districts. And I think this was a measure just to control the, the quality of the teaching, which, which I think makes sense. Any more questions? Thank you. That was fascinating. I'd like to know about your concept of culture. Um, you, you connect culture with philanthropy in a sense, saying that uh, the private enterprises or private initi initiatives would go the philanthropic way. Would there be other ways, except for the Confucius Institute, which we know, um, other ways for privately initiated um, projects to come? I'm thinking of theater, uh, literature, of course. And we do see it, but it's very sporadic rather than organized. So is there any way, what I'm asking, is there any way to organize other than through state? Based. Well, I think I think my whole example of, of, of this Wanda Corporation right. purchase purchasing the, these these theaters in the U.S. is a tip, is just an example of just that. I think there are a lot. Like, um, I I think this is the biggest one, and it, it it's probably going to be followed by others. I think the the reason why I think that the the Wanda project is going to be working is that they have uh, their main incentive is still to make money. It has to be financially viable to do it, and, and in that sense, it's it's you know they they're actually going to be able to, to 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 let the project actually you know grow and and, and be sustainable. Um, theater, I'm I'm not sure if if there is any theater in the world that's actually sort of from a d purely business standpoint is 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 sort of successful in itself. Uh, but I think you might see a lot of these projects and also I, I, I meet a lot of entrepreneurs in China that have a background in film or theater or something but then because of the just the social climate in China they've chosen a different path so they've become uh, you know they've started investing in real estate and 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 so, but they still nourish that dream, and and a lot of these entrepreneurs that do these kinds of um, projects, specifically of, of promoting Chinese culture, um, they have that kind of some kind of connection to some artistic community in some sense. And at least some some of the people that I met have had that kind of kind of connection, and and it seems to be fulfilling something within them to be part of this, and and if they can combine it with sort of also a sense of of helping China. To restore its position, then it all makes so much more sense for them, and 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 in in that the project becomes something that gives them meaning in 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 a, in a sort of a, a social landscape that sometimes can be kind of harsh to to live in and work in. So. If there is uh, no more question, we'll bring this session to an end. Uh, I would like to thank Eric Tomquist one more time. Thank you.